Okay, hello again. One week net down, and I hope your semester has been going well. We are going to finish out some material. Um, my online students who have already seen this, we came close enough to finishing the section that I didn't want to mess around with the due dates, but we'll finish section 1.2. And what we've seen of section 1.2, is Gaussian elimination. And um, Gaussian elimination, let's just take a matrix and put it into what we've called row echelon form. And we've seen that if a matrix is in row echelon form, um, then the if an augmented matrix is in row echelon form, I should say, then the um, corresponding system is easy enough to solve. So we've said that if a matrix is in row echelon form, again, an augmented matrix, that's an important word I keep forgetting, then the corresponding system is easy enough to solve. But we've also seen that solving the corresponding system is kind of a pain. I mean, if we have This just kind of making something up at random. We solve it by starting at the bottom and working up. So if we call our variables X and Y and Z, we can solve for Z. And then once we know what Z is, we can use the second equation to solve for Y and so on. But what would really be nice, a really nice augmented matrix, would look like would would look like this something for example like this matrix because if the augmented matrix looks like this you can um, solve for X and Y and Z instantly in your head without having to do any real work. That first row says that one times X equals three. Now well, it says that one X plus zero Y plus zero Z equals three. But of course, zero Y and zero Z go away. Then that second equation says that Y equals four. That third row says that Z equals five. That's obviously much better than having to do the work we started on this frame. So 
this a matrix that looks like this has a its special name, has its own name, definition. A matrix is in reduced row echelon form if well reduced row echelon form is like a super row echelon form so to be in a reduced row echelon form It has to be in row echelon form. Additionally, the leading entries have to be one. Remember that the leading entries are the first non-zero entries of our row. So this matrix here is not in reduced row echelon form because four is a leading entry and five is a leading entry. Finally, all the numbers above a leading entry must be zero. This third condition should sound quite familiar when we were talking about regular row echelon form, we said that all of the numbers below a leading entry must be zero. So this matrix is in row echelon form. And you see the numbers below the leading entries are indeed zero. But in addition to the leading entries not being one, the numbers above the leading entries are not zero, which also keeps this from being in row echelon form. Sorry, reduced row echelon form. This matrix is in reduced row echelon form. You look again at the conditions. Those three ones are the leading entries. The leading entries are all one. It's in row echelon form. The numbers below the leading entries are zero. Furthermore, the entries above the leading entries are all zero. So this is a matrix in reduced row echelon form. And we were able to just read the solutions off without mucking around with equations like this. So when we're solving a system of linear equations, Reduced row echelon form is better than row echelon form. But how do you put a matrix into reduced row echelon form? Well, Again, reduced row echelon form is like a super hyped up for 
hours in of row echelon form. So the first thing you do is put the matrix in row echelon form. And there's a name for that. We called that gauss Jordan elimination. And then we keep going. We perform some more steps. And we get the matrix into reduced row echelon form. And, uh, Sorry, my mind, I'm a scatterbrain today. We did not call that Gauss-Jordan. Putting the matrix into row echelon form, we called Gaussian elimination. No Jordans to be found. Going the whole hog and putting the matrix into reduced row echelon form, that is Gauss-Jordan elimination. And Gauss-Jordan elimination is done very similar to Gaussian elimination. In fact, it starts off identically to Gaussian elimination. You um, I'm kind of repeating myself, but this Gaussian elimination is part of the Gauss-Jordan elimination. So. You have a matrix and it's not in any kind of reduced form. And you say, we're going to put this into reduced row echelon four. We're going to perform the full Gauss-Jordan elimination. Well, you start with the Gaussian elimination. And most of you have done homework with this, so I'm not going to, to dwell on it, but we use this one up here to eliminate that one down there. So formally speaking, you take the second row and you take the first row and you multiply the first row by negative one and you add it to the second. Row. And we then get um, zero and two and zero and zero. Okay, wasn't expecting all those zeros, but no harm done. And now we'll use the top row, we'll use that one I have a box around to eliminate this two down here. So we can multiply the first row by negative two and add it to the third row.
So let's see. Zero, negative three, negative five, negative one. And now we move down and to the right. And we're still performing the Gaussian elimination. We're still just trying to get this into row echelon form. And since we uh, have so many zeros in that second row, I mean, we can use the two to eliminate the negative three. Yeah. Um, we would what? We would multiply the second row by positive three halves and then add it to the third row. Another thing we could do, there's, there's an elementary row operation we haven't used yet. which is uh, multiplying a row by a constant, we could multiply that second row by a one half. And the only, the only advantage of this, I guess it doesn't make a big difference because of all the zeros, but you do get, you do avoid fractions this way. And now continuing with the Gauss-Jordan elimination. At the moment, we're still in the Gaussian stage of things. Moving down and to the right, we want to use that one to eliminate the negative three below it. And in particular, we can take that second row and we can multiply it by three and add it to the third row. Again, all of those zeros are making this uh, kind of flukishly easy because of course, Zero times uh, three plus zero is still zero. Zero times three plus negative five is still negative five. Zero times zero plus negative one is still negative one. Sorry, zero times three plus negative one is still negative one. And this matrix is in row echelon four. So this is in row echelon form. It's not in reduced row echelon form. And there are a few reasons for that. We've got a leading entry other than one here, can't have that. And we have this three, which is above a leading entry and is not zero. And we have that two, which is above a leading entry and is not zero. So three things stopping this from being in reduced row echelon form. Um, notice, by the way, um, it's only the leading entries we're asking questions about here. So this last column is perfectly fine. There are no leading entries in the last column, so nothing has to be a zero. It's only in the columns with leading entries 
set stuff as to be zero. So I mentioned this before, but um, when you perform rho echelon, when you perform Gaussian elimination and put a matrix into rho echelon form, um, there's an elementary row operation that you never have to use. And that is multiplying a row by a constant. Um, you can always perform Gaussian elimination using just two of the three elementary row operations. Here, when we're trying to put it into reduced row echelon form is where we're really going to need that third elementary row operation. Because we want that negative five to be a positive one. And we can accomplish this if we multiply the third row by negative one fifth, that will turn that negative five to positive one. And we have not solved all of our problems yet. This is still not in reduced row echelon form, but it's closer to being in reduced row echelon form than we were a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago. We've gone from having three problems to having two problems. Our leading entries are now what we want them to be. But we still have that two and that three. And um, the Gauss-Jordan process I mean, you've already seen how we turn numbers into zero. The Gauss-Jordan process is just Gaussian elimination kind of in reverse. Now, instead of starting at the upper left, we start at the lower right. And we use that one to turn everything above it into zero. And um, happily, we have to do only one thing here. Um, that is already a zero, no need to do anything with that row. But the fun thing about doing this stuff by hand is that you make a little mistake and then your answer is wrong and it will take you half an hour to troubleshoot. So it's just as well that I noticed now that uh, that one was not supposed to have turned into a zero. That was a type. So to turn the three into zero, we multiply the third row by negative three, and we add it to the first row. And it's sort of unfortunate that we're out of space here. Oh, 
book. Our third row we're leaving alone. Our second row we're leaving alone. We already have the zero that we need. The third row or the first row. Okay, so we multiply the third row by negative three and add it to the first row. And notice that the one and the two don't change. Because when you multiply zero by negative three, it's still zero. And then zero plus other numbers, well, that's not changing those numbers. So the one and the two aren't changing. This is turning to zero, just like we want. And as for the one, negative three-fifths plus one, is positive two-fifths. And now we're almost there. We keep moving up and to the left. Again, this is sort of the opposite of the first phase. It's the opposite of Gaussian elimination, where you move down and to the right. Here, we now move up and to the left, and there's our next leading entry, and we'll use it to get rid of that two sitting above it. So we can multiply the second row by negative two and add it to the first row. And again, notice that in the first row, a lot of entries just don't change because we have these zeros and negative two times zero is zero. Adding zero doesn't do anything. In fact, in this particular example, the only thing that changes is that that two turns to zero. And this is in reduced row echelon form. It's an augmented matrix. So I didn't always use the uh, the dotted notation, but I was using it here. And this an augmented matrix corresponds to a system of equations, and we can now read off the answer to that system of equations. X one is two fifths. X2 is zero, X3 is one fifth. I might say now, by the way, sort of the good news is we're not going um, a, a huge amount of linear algebra is based on Gauss-Jordan elimination. And it would clearly get very tiresome, very fast, if we had to do this by hand constantly. So pretty soon, I mean, maybe Thursday, we'll learn how to do Gauss-Jordan elimination on the calculator and all of this sort of messy handwork will recede into the background. But you should be able to perform this process manually as long as the matrix is, you know, relatively small. Um, so that's now stored in elimination. A few comments. Um,
We can think of Gauss stored in elimination as being two, you know, processes. First, you do the one phase that puts you into row echelon form, then a second phase that puts you into reduced row echelon form. And putting a matrix into row echelon form is, I, I wrote slow on the board, slow's overstating it. It's not that bad, but it's the slowest part of the algorithm. Once we have a matrix in row echelon form, it's very quick to put it in reduced row echelon form. And the reason I mention this is that um, throughout this class, we'll be using our calculators to put matrices into row echelon form. And usually, if I need a matrix in row echelon form, I go ahead and just put it into reduced row echelon form. And my rationale is that I'm not really losing a lot of time doing that. I mean, maybe my calculator takes one one hundredth of a second more or something, but it really doesn't hurt anything. Um, since we'll be doing stuff on our calculator, we should say just a word about numerical stability. This is not a numerical linear algebra class, but occasionally we do have things to say about the algorithms we use. Um, you have to do a little stuff behind the scenes, but Gauss-Jordan elimination is safe to perform on your calculator. It's what we would call numerically stable. And I mentioned that that this process, you can think of it as first row echelon form, then reduced row echelon form. Because this process is so neatly broken up into two phases. We give those phases names. Putting the matrix into row echelon form is called the forward phase. Putting the matrix into reduced row echelon form is called the backward phase. And I feel like I slightly lost the plot and rambled a little earlier. All I was trying to say is that the backward phase is quick. And that's Gauss stored in elimination. We could do more examples, but we're very slightly behind. It's not a problem as yet, but I am going to move forward and you can look at our online videos or the textbooks if you want further examples.